My name is Daphne McFerrin. I am the executive director of the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change at the University of Memphis. And I'd like to welcome you tonight to our live stream event on exploring the African-American experience through art. We are great, very grateful to work in collaboration with the Metal Museum to present their exhibitions, jewelry, art, adornment, and manifestations of African-American cultural identity. There are two aspects of this exhibition. One is jewelry created by African-American metalsmith, metalsmiths and um, sculptures created by an African-American woman artist. We are very grateful that the Metal Museum has agreed to share this exhibition with the public working with the Hooks Institute through our Facebook live stream. First, before we get started on this exciting event, I'd like to encourage you to like us on Facebook and also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. The Hooks Institute's mission is teaching, studying, and promoting civil rights and social change. We do that through faculty research, community engagement, lecture series, and the creation of documentaries. In addition to that, looking and examining the contribution of African-American artists to the understanding of the African-American and experience, including other minorities, is central to our work. Painters like Romer Bearden, writers like James Baldwin, singers like Aretha Franklin have changed the landscape of our nation through their artistic contributions. They have made, through their art, our nation a fairer and more just place. Tonight, we look at the experience of African-American artists in a contemporary sense and how their cultural identity and experiences shaped the creation of their artwork. So I'd like to get to our main cast. So I'd like to introduce first, uh, Brooke Garcia. Brooke is the collections and exhibition manager at the Metal Museum. She is an alumna of the University of Memphis where she completed her MA in history and a graduate certificate in museum studies. So we're happy to have one of our alum um, run this show and uh, present to the public such an outstanding exhibition. Brooke serves as the emerging music, I'm sorry, Brooke serves as the Memphis Emerging Museum Professionals Group Co-Chair and the Student Outreach Chair on the Tennessee Association of Museums Boards of Directors. Now, Brooke is gonna introduce other presenters tonight, which includes Portia White, Tamisha Edwards, and Dorothy Sadik. So they will be talking about individual pieces in the exhibition, as well as the sculpture. On that note, let me turn it over to Brooke. And when we finish the presentations, we will have about 10 minutes or so for question and answer questions from the public that we can pose to the presenters. So they, I'm very excited to hear these presentations and to see the jewelry and other sculptures you all are going to highlight tonight. Thank you. First, I'd like to start off by thanking Daphne and the rest of the staff at the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change for hosting this program today. As Daphne said, my name is Brooke Garcia, and I am the Collections and Exhibitions Manager at the Metal Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm going to start off with some information about the museum. As the only institution of its kind in North America, and one of few in the world devoted exclusively to metalwork, the Metal Museum leads the way in the celebration, recognition, and promotion of the field of fine metalwork. Our mission is to preserve, promote, and advance the art and craft of fine metalwork. The Metal Museum achieves its mission through our four interrelated program areas, rotating exhibitions of historic and contemporary metalwork, the permanent collection of objects, books, and folios and archives, the metal studios comprised of a blacksmith shop, foundry, repairs and restoration lab, and design lab that provide educational opportunities for metalsmiths through artistic creation, and vibrant community outreach and education for learners of all ages. This broad yet dedicated focus attracts visitors, artists, patrons from all 50 states and from across the globe to the museum each year. 
And I apologize, I think my slideshow is, is doing some interesting transitions, so bear with me, please. <laughs> Tonight, myself and the other Metal Museum staff will be exploring the topic of African-American jewelry through the lens of two recent exhibitions at the Metal Museum. The first is Divine Legacies in Black Jewelry, a group exhibition of over 25 artists that closed this past Sunday. The second exhibition is a solo show featuring Tiff Massey, which is on view at the museum through September 26. I'm going to start by presenting an overview of Divine Legacies, and then I will talk a little about one of the artists in the exhibition and my favorite piece. I will then introduce the other panelists who will speak more about the work in the show and how we engaged with some Memphis artists in a new way. Divine Legacies in Black Jewelry began with the question, what is Black American jewelry? It explores the pluralistic histories of jewelry creation and production in the Black diaspora of the Americas. This exhibition was curated by Lamar R. Gales Jr. and centers on the works and lives of over 25 different jewelry artists to present the first survey of the history of Black diaspora jewelry of its kind. Mr. Gales is an art historian, archaeogemologist, anthropologist of jewelry, gems, and metals, and a jeweler. Most of the jewelry in this exhibition is from his personal collection. While, artists, while the artists represented in this exhibition have varying definitions of Black identity and conceptions of how their identities relate to their work, all of them personally identify as members of the Black diaspora in some way. Emphasizing recurring themes in the jewelry on exhibit, such as the use of symbols and cultural materials, metals, as well as gemstones and minerals, this exhibition reveals that while there are visual and conceptual similarities among these works, Black jewelry is not one type of object. In addition to over 70 jewelry pieces, Divine Legacies featured a video interview with Mr. Gales. It was important to me to have the, his actual voice echoing in the galleries, talking about the work and the importance of this exhibition. As an emerging curator, Mr. Gales had difficulties gaining access to work by Black jewelry, by Black, black jewelers for study, so over the past five to six years, he has been amassing a personal collection of jewelry to study, most of which was on display in this exhibition. My favorite piece in the exhibition is part of Mr. Gales's collection. It was made by Winifred Mason Cheney. Initially, art historians attributed Art Smith with being the first noted Black American jeweler of the 20th century. But in truth, that distinction belongs to Mason Cheney, his mentor and later business partner. She began her career in metalwork in the 1940s after being complimented on a pin she taught herself to make. After working on jewelry at home, Mason Cheney opened and maintained a studio and store in Greenwich Village, where she later hired Art Smith. While much of her jewelry was custom made, it was also sold at national department stores like Lord & Taylor. She earned a reputation for bold jewelry pieces and her work was even featured on the cover of Ebony Magazine. Divine Legacies in Black Jewelry featured 13 pieces by Mason Cheney, but now I would like to talk about my favorite piece by her in the exhibition, a leaf brooch she made that was on display in the center wall case. This brooch is likely the oldest piece in the exhibition, dating back to the 1940s. Mr. Gales determined this based on the stamp signature on the back of the brooch. This piece is stamped with her maiden name, Mason, while the other work by her in this exhibition is all stamped with Cheney her married name that she used to mark her later work. This brooch is my favorite piece in the exhibition because of the history it represents. Mason Cheney was just is just now beginning to be acknowledged as the first modern African-American jewelry designer. 
What is exciting to me about this topic is that Mr. Gales and other scholars are just beginning to dive into the history of Black American jewelry, and they are still discovering new artists to add to the art historical canon. I'm now going to introduce our other panelists tonight who will talk more about some other artists in the exhibition and topics in Divine Legacies. I'm gonna start with Portia White. She is the Metal Museum's Community Outreach and Rentals Coordinator. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in English Lit from Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri in 2011. She has worked with infants, elementary schoolers, and teens from underinvested communities across Colorado and in the greater Memphis area for the last 10 years. Portia will speak more about Winifred Mason Cheney, including her life in Haiti and her voodoo inspired jewelry. Um, the next panelist is Tamisha Edwards. She is the museum's guest services coordinator. She is new to the museum family, but is not new to the art world. She attended Bates College where she majored in dance. After graduating in 2015, she followed her passion and became a professional dancer, choreographer, and teacher who loves creating mixed media performative works. Tamisha is going to talk about Charnel Holloway, whose work Trinity was the only sculptural piece in the Divine Legacies exhibition. Our next panelist is Dorothy Swedick, and she is the exhibitions coordinator at the Metal Museum. She graduated with her MA in museology from the University of Washington, where she specialized in museum evaluation. A lifelong museum lover, she is passionate about leveraging her skills in interpretation and evaluation to help museums build just and equitable communities. Dorothy will be speaking about some community connections we made with Divine Legacies and highlighting two artists in the exhibition, Lamurchi Frazier and Karen Smith. Now I'm going to pass things on to Portia. Thank you, Brooke. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. So I too was um, really intrigued and inspired by the work of Winifred Mason Cheney, um, particularly the voodoo jewelry piece that's Peter Castor um, that he is wearing. I'm going to butcher it smells and that he's wearing around his neck. Here it is. <laughs> Hold on. Um, so I think to start, I will talk about Sinead's life in Haiti. Um, she was given a fellowship, I believe it's the Rosenwald Fellowship in 1945. And she got the opportunity to go to Haiti for five months. Um, while she was in Haiti, she started to kind of capture some of the uh, culture and gathering, she would gather folk material and find inspiration through that. Um, she's been a lot of time at a place called Le Centre des Art in Port-au-Prince. Um, I believe that's also where she met her husband. Uh, the thing that I found really interesting is that while she was there in Haiti, she started to experiment with other material. She does use a lot of copper. There's copper rings, copper pendants. But after this experience in Haiti, she started to experiment more with uh, silver, gold and pewter. And if I may, I was super interested and really loved her statement that she used um, when she applied for the Rosenwald Fellowship. And she said, through the medium of jewelry, I shall aim to express the desires and aspirations of the West Indian people, which are parallel to the desires and aspirations of the American Negro or any other group which has felt the yoke of oppression and injustice. So. After her experience in Haiti, she did return to New York. I believe she had a store in Greenwich Village where she sold Haitian art, um, as well as some of her custom-made jewelry. And in 1948, she married Jean-Evan Chenet, and they returned to Haiti. And she also had a store with him where they had a manufacturing business, and they sold jewelry to tourists, as well as other people in Haiti, and that's when you start to see a lot more of her work that stamped Sinead de Haiti, or if I'm saying that correctly. Um, but I really love this piece because you can kind of see her desire to highlight the mysticism, the spirituality, and the beauty behind voodoo and the Haitian people. 
particularly, I think it was a bold move in the 1950s and late 40s to do this work because that was a time when voodoo was definitely mysterious, but also highly demonized and just seen as something that was heathenous. And she was able to find some sort of connection to the point where she could see beauty in it. Um, hanging above the, the knife in this pendant, you can see like twinkling stars, which I think is another kind of nod to the mysticism and a little bit of um, appreciation, as well as I believe it's an ox or a calf, something that was commonly used for religious sacrifice. So I really love this piece. I think it just highlights her mission and her vision and her ability to achieve everything that she set out to do by learning from the people of Haiti. Um, and as I go on, I will admit that she did eventually leave Haiti in the early 1960s. I believe in 1963, her husband was murdered and she eventually left Haiti. She fled actually, went back to New York, continued to live a peaceful life, continued to make jewelry, continued to live out her mission and her vision of paying homage to the black diaspora through her work. And um, without further ado, I will take it to the next panelist. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about Charnel Holloway. Um, Miss Holloway was always involved in the arts, um, visual arts, piano, and dance. But influenced by her mother, who was also an artist, she decided to focus on visual arts. She got her BA from Spelman College in Atlanta, um, where she, her focus was on um, life drawings. She then went to go get her MFA from Georgia State University, where she got her um, degree in jewelry. After that, she returned to Spelman, where she helped to create um, Spelman's jewelry curriculum, making it one of three HBCUs in the country to offer jewelry making as a part of its overall college curriculum. Um, Holloway's work focuses on exploring arts and craft movements, non-Western craft, and also um, a dormant perspective. As you can see in this piece, it's called Trinity, circa 2001, The Fates, as it is also called. Um, she makes these marionettes, and to me, they're stunning. Um, as a dancer, I'm always drawn to sculptures and to pieces of art that elicit movement or the feeling of movement. And you can tell that her dance background comes into play here as they look as if they're dancing. Um, my background is specifically in West African um, traditional dance. And so these pieces to me elicit that same feeling that I get when I'm dancing myself. Also, I would love to point out the kinky coily nature of their hair down to the detail of them being adorned themselves, all the way down to um, what I can only assume are sacred items that they are holding themselves. They look like goddesses, if you ask me. Also, I love her use of mixed metals and the way that she's able to portray so many different emotions in three different statues, um, from the lips to the nose to the eyes. They are just simply stunning. Um, and so that is my piece and I will pass it on to Dorothy. Thank you to Misha and um, thank you to the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change for allowing us an opportunity to share a little bit with you about Divine Legacies and Blood Jewelry as well as our tributary show, Tiff Massey, Everyday Arsenal. Um, I wanted to take a step back before I started talking about some of the artwork to just um, take a moment to share with you all what an incredible opportunity that this exhibition um, presented us as a museum to be able to connect with and involve our community here in Memphis in a really meaningful way. And one way we did that was through the catalog, which you see <laughs> on the screen now. Um, it was really exciting. We were lucky enough to be um, presented with a grant from the Center for Craft, which supported the research that backed up this exhibition as well as funded this incredible catalog, um, which helped us really document some of these unsung heroes of jewelry and art, art history in a way. And so as we were thinking about how, like conceptualizing this catalog, um, it really became important to us to highlight some of the jewelry being worn and um, highlighting it being worn on 
what its target audience might have been as it was being produced and sold. So we were really lucky to be able to work with our curator, Lamar Argales Jr., who granted us a little bit of leeway and um, with some careful considerations taken for the safety of the artwork being worn, um, we were able to kind of launch into this project of doing a photo shoot for some of the jewelry in his collection. So in the spirit of other duties as assigned, which is classic in the museum world, um, we started reaching out to local photographers and models as potential collaborators on this project. We worked with um, a local photographer named Louis Ziggy Tucker, as well as three models, Myrna Garcia Herrera, Nicolette Hatchett and Carl Bledsoe Jr., who you see on the screen now, to really bring this jewelry to life. And I can't credit them enough for their skill and talent that they shared with us in working on this project. Um, and in addition to the catalog, um, we were able to use their images and their faces and all of our associated marketing materials, including a billboard you might see as you drive around Memphis. So it was really exciting for us to be able to work with this community of creators um, that we might not normally have an opportunity to work with. So it was a wonderful collaboration. And I think it brought us closer to the artistic community in Memphis. And the catalog is currently um, on for sale through the museum. You can purchase it online on our website. And it includes some really great um, scholarly materials in addition to these beautiful photographs. We have an in-depth essay by Mr. Gales about the artists um, in Divine Legacies, as well as the, the pieces themselves, a deeper dive into some of the larger themes that run through all of the artwork in the exhibition. So I'll transition now to talk some about the pieces that really speak to me that um, were in the exhibition. And the first two um, are by Lamerchi Frazier, who's a Florida-born and Boston-based visual performance artist. Um, and she currently works in the museum space as well in the Boston area. She serves as the Director of Education and, and Interpretation at the Museum of African American History, their Boston and Nantucket campuses. Um, and in particular, Lamerchi's work um, from the ship series are really pieces that I'm drawn to. Conceptually, the ships series explores the topic of the forced transportation of enslaved people from the African continent to the Americas and beyond. And the series as a whole honors the lives of the African and indigenous people that traveled in those ships and some of the lives that were lost in the in transit. But the piece um, I'll talk about first is the one with the garnets. And that piece is called The Reckoning, The Desire, 1638 Boston MA. And the desire was actually a ship that arrived in the Massachusetts Bay from the West Indies, February 26th of 1638. It carried a cargo of cotton, tobacco, and as far as we know, some of the first enslaved African people that were transported to Massachusetts. This piece is really in honor of the intersections of enslaved Africans and indigenous people that were um, forcibly taken, exchanged for goods, and then arrived in the Americas or in America. What I love about this piece is the, the garnets in particular, which represent the treasured people who came from a continent of sun, which I think is just really impactful. Additionally, you can see some of uh, Fraser's interdisciplinary work shine through with her treatment of the garnets. They're kind of beaded and, and woven like in her other beaded pieces and some of her fiber art. So I think it's a really great encapsulation of her interdisciplinary practice. The other um, piece that you see on the screen is called Moonwatch, La Amistad, 1839, Long Island, New York. La Amistad was also a ship used to transport enslaved people. It's really known as the, the, a ship that um, a successful revolt of enslaved Mende people from Sierra Leone took place on that ship um, in July of 1839, which was led by Joseph Sinke. And due to the illegal transportation of these enslaved people from Africa, um, interestingly enough, a legal battle ensued over La Amistad that ended in restoring the freedom of the Mende people aboard the ship. La Amistad became a symbol for abolitionists in the United States for that reason. 
And this piece in particular is meant to honor the enslaved Africans that experienced the moon as protection for their nighttime arrivals on American shores. So all of this series of work really speaks to me, but these two pieces in particular for the materials they use and the larger stories they help convey. Um, moving from Lamurchi Frazier, another artist I think is really worth mentioning that was in this exhibition is Karen Smith. Um, she's a metal artist, educator, and activist. She's based in Oakland, California. She's self-taught and mostly works in sterling and fine silver, sometimes incorporating gemstones into her work. Her jewelry is informed by her African-American heritage and a short study under a master goldsmith in Dakar, Senegal. You can see her use of circles and curves, which um, represent light and power and the feminine in her pendant and brooch that you see here, as well as her use of cowrie shells, which are symbolic in many diasporic cultures. And I think what's really notable about Karen Smith is in addition to her jewelry works and her artistic endeavors, she has done incredible work as an educator and activist in the jewelry community and beyond, which is personally very inspiring to me. Smith founded an organization called We Wield the Hammer, which is a metal smith training program for women and girls of African descent in 2019, and it's still going strong. She was inspired to start We Wield the Hammer after her experience studying her craft in West Africa and being the only woman metal smith around. And some of that is also tied to that experience of being the only woman metal smith around in that a lot of the young women in West Africa where she was studying would regard her with awe because women don't wield the hammer in that community. So her experiences as a metal smith and also through her travels and studying abroad really inspired her to create this incredible initiative that's supporting and uplifting um, women and girls of color in the United States currently and really contributing to the field and craft of fine metal work. So thank you all for um, taking a look or deeper dive into these artists with me. And I'd like to turn it back over to Brooke who will tell you a little bit about the second exhibition in tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Um, and I'm gonna switch gears like she said and start with uh, talking about um, our second exhibition, Tributaries, Tiff Massey, everyday arsenal. So I wanted to start with a little bit of information about our tributary series um, derived from the museum's location along the Mississippi River. The tributaries exhibition series features artists whose work is beginning to have a significant impact on the metal arts community. Tiff Massey is one such artist. We are proud to have brought Tiff Massey's installation to the museum in her, for this exhibition. Tiff Massey is an interdisciplinary artist from Detroit, Michigan. She holds an MFA in metalsmithing from Cranbrook Academy of Art. Her work inspired by African standards of economic vitality includes both large scale and wearable sculptures, music and performance. Massey counts the iconic material cultures of 1980s hip hop as a major influence in her jewelry. She uses contemporary observances of class and race through the lens of an African diaspora, combined with inspiration from her experience in Detroit. Massey's practice is rooted in jewelry and adornment. Her practice began with wearable jewelry, solely focusing on the body. The relationship between objects and the body changes with exploration of scale and new spaces, interior or exterior, to adorn. Her installation, Everyday Arsenal, is a scaled up version of the rings Massey designed and created for her own fashion aesthetic, with the forms in the installation simulating large rings made of steel. I'm going to read this quote from Massey. Um, according to her, my experience with jewelry became my gateway to other media, to a larger perspective, and to making large scale sculpture, always with a consistent emphasis on adornment. Inspired by hip hop jewelry, growing up in the 80s and going to get custom jewelry made with her father, the decision behind scaling up the work in everyday arsenal is simply the wow factor. 
Massey explains it as whether it's a sculpture on a wall, an object set in an outdoor landscape, or jewelry worn by the viewer. My work maintains an engagement of the body itself. To completely understand the installation, Massey encourages you and everyone to visit the Metal Museum and engage with her work. As you step into this mirrored installation, Massey welcomes you to her jewelry box. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone that Everyday Arsenal will be on view at the museum until September 26. And that actually um, concludes all the information I had um, for this program today. So I wasn't sure if anyone had any questions. So this is uh, Daphne McFerrin again. And I'd first like to um, direct my question to Dorothy Swedick. So Dorothy, um, when she comes on the screen, and you're mute. I'd like to um, thank you for including one of our uh, students, the Hooks Institute student, and I actually taught him, Carl Bledsoe. And I thought there was Carl Bledsoe in the photograph. So thank you. And also I wanted to ask, how did you go about recruiting your models um, for the photo shoots of the jewelry? Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm so glad you saw a face you recognized among our models. Carl's incredible. He was really delightful to work with and definitely a mover and shaker in his own right, like in his field of photography and modeling. Um, yeah, th so that's a great question about how we kind of approached the recruitment and what we were really looking for as far as our models. So some of that came from early conversations with the curator Lamar Argales about who he thought should be um, represented as modeling his work as someone who knows the collection and knows the intent behind these artists and their audiences better than we did. And he really expressed a desire to include um, like a wide range of folks, um, whether it was um, skin tone or kind of height, just all different um, body shapes and sizes. So that was something we were trying to be really um, cognizant of as we started this process. I will admit a lot of it was just um, me leveraging social media <laughs> and, and doing some research on our end. Um, Ziggy was really helpful and had some great recommendations. That's how we actually got a hold of Nicolette. And we're so grateful that she was a part of this project. But honestly, a lot of it was me on social media trying to troll the right hashtags <laughs> and find the right folks. And I was able to use um, the Metal Museum Instagram as a way to reach out to folks until we got to a point where we were communicating via email. But um, yeah, it was really testament in a, in a lot of ways to the power of social media and helping us connect and learn about these artists who are practicing in Memphis. Great. Yeah, uh, so Brooke, Brooke, my next question is for you. What has been the reaction, what was the reaction of the Memphis community to uh, both exhibits? Did it increase um, uh, museum visitor turnout among certain communities? Uh, and how will it impact, if at all, future exhibitions? Right, so actually, um, we've had a really big turnout for both of these exhibitions. Um, and more diverse visitors than I think we've ever had, um, which was really great to see. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback and it just so happened that these two exhibitions were scheduled at the same time. It wasn't actually intentional. Um, we had to shift some things around due to um, COVID. Um, so we were moving and playing with our schedule and these two ended up at the same time. But it actually provided a very interesting contextualization for Tiff's Massey's work um, because um, it's harder to relate sometimes for visitors in those immersive installation spaces. So being able to visit both exhibitions, one of which was more wearable sized jewelry, it really put into context these large ring sculptures with other um, artists who are practicing in wearable jewelry and kind of showed where Tiff was coming from with scaling up these pieces to be interacted with in a different way, but. Yeah, and the Tiff Massey uh, exhibition is still up, is that correct? It's still up, yes. So it'll be up for another two weeks. All right, but the individual jewelry collection is closed. 
Is that right? Yes, unfortunately, it, um, it just closed this past Sunday, um, but we did have a very uh, closing reception where we had a very big turnout of folks listening to um, our curator, Mr. Gales, talking about the work. And um, we do have a video interview available on our YouTube page of Mr. Gales, the one that was playing in the gallery, if people want to hear more about the work and, and see more of it. Another question we we have is, um, do African-American jewelers avoid working with certain gemstones like diamonds because of the oppressive history associated with those stones or because of the cost? Um, to my knowledge, a lot of it is access um, and trying to get a hold of those more expensive raw materials to work with is sometimes a concern. Um, it was actually, a, we had a similar question come up in our artist panel we did for this exhibition, which is also on our YouTube page, um, that it can be somewhat of a barrier to try to work with fine metals like silver and gold. And so one of the points that Lamar was making with, with some of the artists in the show who worked with like copper and pewter or less expensive metals may have been because of access, but also may have been because of what they meant in, in African culture that he could understand. So there, something he talks about in the essay that he wrote for our catalog is these warmer metals of copper and brass have different connections. Um, so that may be what drew those artists to those materials versus the more fine materials like diamonds or gold or silver. So here's a question from one of our uh, Facebook viewers and after my own heart, if one is interested in purchasing jewelry, from one of the great artists, where would one look? So all of the artists, um, well, not all of them, most of the artists who are living have websites that they can purchase work through. Um, one of the artists in the show, um, her name is Alicia Goodwin. She runs a store called Lingua Negra, is actually um, carried, her work is carried in the museum store. So you can purchase some work through the museum. Um, but a lot of the artists who are still practicing now have personal websites that you can go visit and purchase work directly from. I know Sandy Baker has work available and a couple other artists as well. Is the exhibition booklet you sh uh, that was shown earlier in the presentation, is that available for purchase still? Yes, it is available for purchase online on our museum website. Um, and we just received them in-house last week. So um, we have right up right now a pre-order, so we can go ahead and purchase that, but we will be shipping those out soon. So, And that has um, images of all the jewelry in the show and a couple of biographies from the major artists that Mr. Bales wrote, in addition to his great essay about sort of deeper interpretation of the work. Well, first of all, let me say I'm also a member of the Metal Museum, so I really appreciate um, this exhibition and all the other fine uh, work on display. And I hope that there will be future opportunities to collaborate um, when there are exhibitions that dovetail with the work that we do in our mission. And especially in, the, in a case like this, where you have local artists who help shape how the exhibition is put together and viewed is very important. So I'd like to thank each of you on the staff. I know this is after hours, but each of you for um, your uh, time and effort and contributions um, to our understanding of the jewelry, jewelry tonight. And I would also encourage, because I now see another uh, question about where we can we find more information about Well the, the Hammer. Um, so I, I'm going to ask it since it came up late. So let me ask you that and we can end on that question. Um, so uh, Karen Smith actually has a website for We Wield the Hammer. I believe it is we, we wield the hammer .org, um, that you can um, go to and learn more about the organization. I believe it is a nonprofit and you can support that organization as well. Okay. Well, I encourage everyone again to like the Hooks Institute on Facebook and other social media and also check out the Metal Museum, which I think is a amazing gem for the city of Memphis. Thanks to each of our panelists and I look forward to seeing our Facebook family uh, at our next Facebook Live event, which is on October 5th. It's part two of our examination of critical race theory, what it is and what it isn't, and examining the recent Tennessee law, which bans the teaching of certain, what they call prohibited concepts in classroom discussion. 
And most of those concepts revolve around the issue of race and privilege. So we look forward to seeing our Facebook family and other people who are new to our community on October 5th at 6 p.m. Thank you and thanks to all of our participants. Good night.